Hi, everyone. Welcome to the second of two special episodes of Second Act Actors as part of our Why Week. This is a difficult time in the industry for actors, especially up here in Canada. The seasons are changing. It's getting darker outside. It's colder. It's winter. They don't film as much stuff here in the winter because it's so cold. So I don't know if you have noticed the same thing as me, but audition numbers are on the decline. And it can be very frustrating this time of year to feel creatively inspired. And why are we doing this in the first place? So I wanted to talk to these two guests. The first of you already heard, Claudia, end of life doula. And now my second guest guest to kind of re-inspire us and try and figure out what is our why, why are we doing this, reigniting the passion, what brought us here in the first place, if it was burnout, if it was midlife crisis, whatever you want to call it, and then how do we pull ourselves out of it to get through what can be a really tough season as an actor. My guest this episode is Dr. Becky Van Ursel. Becky is a colleague of mine and a friend and a true inspiration to me. We work together up here in kind of Muskoka region, and she has an incredible story of experiencing significant burnout as a physician and doing a big 180 in her career. She's done a lot of research and work with people regarding burnout and has noticed that the symptoms that people with severe burnout experience are very interconnected, very similar to people experiencing severe trauma and PTSD. So her work has been leading towards figuring out better treatment, management, and societal realizations that there is this parallel. She also, after she experienced her burnout and came out of it, bought a farm. She has farm animals, she does yoga at her farm, and as she explains in this episode, she is literally farming joy. So she has found joy from a time of significant, significant burnout and personal life stress. She has an incredible story, and I hope you learn a lot from her. She's done a lot of research into trauma, addictions, and burnout. I know she's a big inspiration for me, not just as a physician, but as a human being and as a you know, recovering creative. Please enjoy the incredible story of Dr. Becky Van Ursel. Tell me your story. I mean, I know you're not an actor or anything like that, but you are kind of an inspiration, at least to me, regarding what you've done with your personal and professional life. No pressure. I was going to say, no pressure. Tell my story. This is so interesting. Um, because, so which version of me would you like to hear and which story do I tell? Um, and how far back do I start that? Okay, so I I think I'll go. So I, I grew up, I'm a small town girl. I grew up uh, with two parents who were like uh, farm kids, suburban Niagara Falls, actually. Uh, but but um, really early in my life, we moved overseas. My dad is a hydraulics engineer, so he builds hydroelectric dams, and we moved overseas. So I spent three years that were really formative for me in Kathmandu, Nepal, and then we moved back, moved back to Niagara Falls. My parents also, they're really interesting people, and they're like urban homesteaders before that was a thing. So like in the 80s, they bought the property next to them in suburbia, and we had a full-size um, lot garden. So we pickled, and we canned and we made our own jam and like my parents still do that and my mom to this day will pop into my house and if she sees like a jar of Bix in my fridge is like Becky, why didn't you tell me I could have brought you pickles if if things are that bad that you're buying pickles <laughs> so, so that's kind of where I come from and who I am and and so my parents really value kind of self-sufficiency and and uh, I railed against that for a whole lot of years, I think, and now I've kind of come full circle around to that, which we'll get to in a little bit. But um, So I knew uh, when I was working in Nepal that I wanted to go into healthcare in some way. Like, I just, I kind of felt called to that. My mom 
uh, living over there. I think she was bored, like expat. The kids are gone during the day, and so she volunteered. Um, and my mom's got an admin background, so she volunteered in a free clinic for women and children. And on my days off, I actually spoke a little Nepali and had a little bit of written language. And so I'd go in with her and I'd do like patient registration. And um, and I remember this mom bringing in this baby. I'd have been 11 maybe. And this mom like walked days in from the hills to Kathmandu because she'd heard about this clinic to have her baby taken care of. And she'd been feeding it flower water because formula and NGO had dropped off, was had gone. Anyway, um, and so it didn't take a train die. This 11 year old knew this baby was cachectic. And, and to see over the next couple of days, this baby put on weight and thrive. And it was really amazing. And so I kind of got really grounded in healthcare and universal healthcare and access. And, um, and then I kind of had a purpose. So I was academically, I thrived super competitive. Um, and threw myself into that. Um, through high school, got into med school kind of as quick as I could. Like I fast tracked, I knew what I wanted. I had my eye on it. So I uh, graduated, went into family medicine um, because I experienced family medicine here actually where we live in the same town. And I'd come up here as a med student. I was like this, I want this. I want to be that kind of doctor. I want to do it all. Like, and I didn't find anything else that I loved so much that I wanted to give up everything else. I loved that breadth. But I think some of that was also that competitive part of me, right? The like, I can do it all and I'm going to do it all and I can do it better than them. And I can. And so I was just trying to do everything. So, um, so I was a rural resident up here. I, I, then I stayed and, um, I got married in med school. We had a kid along the way. I set up my practice, had a few more kids and then after my last mat leave realized, I, like I was sprinting, right? Like between mat leaves and catching up and then getting ready for the next mat leave. And I was just constantly sprinting and I was really good at that, like doing that. And then after my last mat leave, I realized I'm like, oh no, now I've got to settle in for a marathon. And I don't know how to do that. And I don't think I can sustain this pace. I don't, I actually don't know how to do this long term. And I, I, slowly started like giving stuff up I realized I'm like okay my passion's not emerge I'm actually a decent emerge doc but I don't love that and so I gave up emerge uh but then I filled that time with admin which I did love actually I still do like it was like brain candy and creative and problem solving and I loved that and um but it still it didn't it didn't make things better. I wasn't home more. I wasn't, I didn't not feel balanced. I actually felt completely misaligned. I was like, I don't know what this is in me, but this is not, I'm not, I'm not myself. I don't feel like myself. The only times I did feel like myself in those early years of practice were actually when I was on vacation. So it felt like I had like two, I had an alter ego. Like it was like Becky on vacation and my family and my husband would recognize me then. And then I'd come back and I'd be Dr. Van Yersel and I, I just, I didn't even like who I was anymore. So I think when that all sunk in and I, I really had a profound turning point, I was, I was completely burnt out. I did not know that that's what it was. <clears throat> I actually said things like, no, I've just hit a wall or I just have to figure this out. I said to a colleague who I was working with, it's, it's like I'm juggling like eight things all the time. And then somebody throws a ball at me and everything crashes to the ground and now I'm not just trying to juggle nine things I've got to pick them all back up again and figure out how to get them all going and it was a moment because he he looked at me he's like Becky that's just medicine so get used to it like that's just the way this is I was like well shit like that's not what I wanted to hear and if that's true I, I don't know how to do this and I got really um, just more and more. I was getting no joy out of my practice. I really wasn't. I, I, don't, I do know what it was like to show up as a patient with me in those days. And I wouldn't have wanted to sit across from me. Um, so I, I had a moment where, this is ridiculous, um, I was at, I was working out. I got one workout in a week and I was at the gym and I was changing and I 
some uh, just a wash of emotion came over me and I remember <laughs> being like crouched down on the floor almost in the fetal position sobbing and just completely dysregulated right like I, I just couldn't get my shit together to get on the treadmill <laughs> and and I in that in that state was actually calculating a dose of insulin that would just end it and how I would get the dose right so that I could hide the needles so there'd be insurance so that that wouldn't like my brain was just in crazy town and that I I also would make sure it happened so that I wasn't I was not going to end up in the ICU like if I did that I was not gonna mm -hmm. survive right like I was and then it was an almost out-of-body experience where I could actually see myself and I started laughing at me. I'm like, you're freaking ridiculous. Like, get up. <laughs> then change it. And, and I did. I was, then I was laughing. Like, I truly, like, laughing and crying and ridiculous. And that was a turning point. It did not all start getting better then. But at least I was like, you're a smart person fix this then if this is not like you're capable of fixing this and so it was that was the start of a slow kind of crawl out of that hole to say I had to change something I can't live this way and this is not the life I want to leave and and what is it you know in the end what are they going to write on my tombstone and I don't want it to say she's a great doctor <laughs> right like those patients probably aren't going to be at my funeral and so what do I need this to look like and serendipitously around that time a position came up that uh, was a full-time admin job and I'm like awesome that's I think what I am called to do and I resisted that for a whole like a, at least a week I didn't even apply I thought it was ridiculous I bounced back and forth anyways I applied and that turned into a position with what's what was the the Lynn and like a middle management kind of uh, regional governance in the Ontario healthcare system and ultimately I was the vice president of clinical affairs there and it allowed me some time to heal I tried to work and fix the system that I I knew at the time I was like no this is a system problem like I am burning out because I am trying to do it all some of that like I said my own ego my own internal stuff combined with me very reasonably seeing all the holes in the system and knowing my patients are falling through the cracks, but I'm not going to let them. I am super doc and I am going to single-handedly fix the system for my patients. And the thing is, I could a little bit. And so I just, that reinforced it, right? And then I developed this sense that I needed to be there all the time and I couldn't possibly. And anyway, so I went into admin to try and fix some of that and made a few gains, but then... Uh, then the government changed because that's the way that healthcare runs in Canada. And when the government changed, things change. And I knew that I would probably be the first in that change to go. I'm a high ticket item on a, on a budget. So I started doing some extra training. I signed up. I just felt like I was following breadcrumbs. I didn't know where life was going to take me. But and around that time, we actually we downsized. We left our executive bungalow in on the street. Like I think it's actually called Dock Row. Like, it's not actually the address, but it was, like, the premier keeping up with the Joneses. And we, we were just like, this house is owning us. Like, and we downsized, too. We bought a much smaller home and a bigger property. And we have, like, our own little homestead. And we bought the farm. And knowing that that was on the horizon, I knew that kind of, I'm going to get fired. <laughs> I'm going to get laid off, downsized, whatever you want to call it. And... Um, but I also knew that I needed integrity in my life and, and we were small town people. We needed that. And, um, so we bought the farm. We, and I signed up for some training with Brene Brown, who's a, a PhD sociologist, social worker in, in, in University of Texas, I believe. Anyway, so I went down to San Antonio and did some work. That was like a year long thing. It gave me some focus to, you know, transition and I knew that I couldn't go back into family medicine again. So I opened my own practice um, doing primarily mental health. I've always worked in mental health. I still work at the hospital. And now I have all the boys. They all share one room in our little farmhouse. And got, you know, some animals, that ever-expanding kind of animals. And I feel, I feel like myself. I've got some aspects of medicine and I've got <laughs> a 
crazy, happy family farm. I want to touch on the the Brene Brown stuff for sure, because I think a lot of people that I've talked to reference her as an influence. Maybe let's touch on that now first, if you don't mind. It's like reference her as kind of in their transition between their first act career and now second act into acting. The a lot of them have had seen her TED talk or read her book and said, "Oh, that was an eye opener." What have you found about her? I, I am ignorant in, in her teachings and stuff like that. But like, what did you find about her and her like? you know, kind of philosophy and like what you kind of bring into your, your practice about mental health and burnout and stuff like that. Like what can you teach us and why is it that so many people have kind of gravitated towards what she says? Well, I think, so for me, she's totally relatable. So I think a lot of people gravitate towards her style, right? Like she's a really engaging speaker. And for me, um, the fact that, so she is research driven, she's a qualitative researcher, but, but the way in which she comes around to her work, it, there is some rigor to uh, scientifically that kind of appealed to me. Um, and she talks about things in a new language that just, you know, when something like resonates in your soul and you're like, yes, that, that's the thing. When she talks about perfectionism and shame, um, I'd read a couple of her books and was just like, oh my gosh, that's the thing. That's totally what is driving all of this. And her distinctions between shame and guilt. And so things that I would have always called guilt before were actually shame. So in, in a nutshell, guilt is I did bad, right? It's behavior driven. Whereas shame is I am bad. It is an internalized personification of no, I'm, I'm the problem. And I'd have been one of those people, I probably did in my med school interviews, like, what's your biggest flaw? My biggest flaw is that I'm a perfectionist. It's actually a secret. It's not a flaw at all, right? Like, I was touting it, like, let me in. I am, I am <laughs> striving for perfection. But where there's perfection, there's shame, right? Like, that's this total, I'm going to look perfect, act perfect, be perfect. I'm just going to try it because then behind that facade, nobody will know that I'm actually completely inadequate. Like, I don't know shit. And, but I'll just act as if. So in many ways, I was an actor for many years. And now I'm me. So it's like dropping the mask or something, you know, and totally different than this healthy pursuit of excellence, right? Which is, is actually betterment and reflective and learning from your mistakes. That is not perfection. Right? And actually, the two don't co to coexist. So, so I think I think that's a lot of it. I think we select people into medicine who have a lot of those traits, and then we get burnt out because that's not sustainable and it's actually not healthy at all. And you know, I think I think it is changing, but certainly where I trained and when I trained, medicine is still was still very shame-based in the way it was taught, right? Failure was not talked about. It was very much singling people out. So there was some of that that was still very, I mean, we laughed about it being shame-based learning, right? That you prepared the night before to be perfect because when you got called upon, God forbid you didn't have the answer or the, the way in which you'd be treated was shameful. So it perpetuated all of those kind of unhealthy traits in me. And then even now, you know, those, now that the system really is not that, but trying to even be accountable, it triggers all those things in me, right? So if somebody points out my mistakes, I'm like, oh God, that's, I wasn't perfect. I wasn't this. And, and I can feel, now I'm aware of it and I can go, oh, I'm, I'm in a shame shit storm up in my own head. That's my own problem. That's not theirs. I need to go deal with some of that. But, uh, yeah, so that's why I think in medicine we're so primed to that. There's other reasons in other professions that are probably similar in many ways, but, yeah. 
If you don't mind talking about the time when you were at your lowest, that was a big pivot point for you. Do you have any idea why and how that came about? I know the system being a big part of it, which I know is a big part of burnout for a lot of physicians with the like system letting us all down and our lack of control over that. But were there other things that you look back now and say, oh, yeah, there were other reasons? Yeah, I mean, some of it, I mean, uh, and I mentioned some of it was my own stuff, right? Like all of that perfectionism that played out in my practice in interesting ways. It, if somebody had a bad diagnosis, cancer was the one. If somebody developed a cancer and it was diagnosed, and actually if it was diagnosed by somebody else. So I, I had a patient who had this shoulder issue. I could not get on top of this shoulder pain they had. And I'd, I'd examined it. I'd, I'd injected it. I'd, I'd been doing. And the shoulder pain got so bad on a weekend, he went into eMERGE. And the eMERGE doc did an x-ray again but the x-ray had enough of a chest to see a massive pancose tumor so a massive tumor in his lung up there that I went over that chart obsessively what did I miss why didn't I catch this when could I have caught it sooner did did he like going back and just hyper hyper vigilant over how did I fuck this up and could I have caught it sooner would his outcome be different could he have not died could he have and so then because I I really did believe that if I'd caught that sooner he'd have had a different outcome I was now on call 24 7 so it's almost like a penance for this man's dying but amplify that up to an entire practice right so some of it system some of it was me some of it was like an overactive sense of responsibility I mean some of that's all my ego thinking I have control over life and death which I do not, right? Um, some of it was probably stage of life. I mean, I am blessed. My husband's a stay-at-home dad has been. So I can only work the way I was because he enables it. Um, but I felt responsible as the primary income earner, too. And and um, share our fourth, he knows this, our fourth was not a planned pregnancy. <laughs> He knows that he's our happy little surprise, happy little accident, like a Bob Ross tree. <laughs> um, that threw me off my game, right? Like, I knew the financial impact of every one of those mat leaves. And so, you know, there were a few things that kind of all came together in that period of time. There was probably some postpartum associated with all of that that didn't set me up in the best state of mind. Um... And I do, whether it's fair to this colleague who said this thing about the juggling, that stuck in my head that this was just mess. This is unchangeable. You're the problem. You need to change. Well, crap, I'm trying. I'm trying to, but I don't know how to, I don't know how to change. So that, that, yeah, that contributed. In your practice now, and I know, like, again, you've done a lot of work looking at burnout and and stuff like that. I think in your mental health practice now, how would you advise someone or, like, what would you chat about if someone comes into your practice with kind of similar feelings to, say, what you were dealing with when you did the big shift but also just that confusion of exactly what you're saying. I don't know how to change, but I know I need to. Like, how do you coach someone with that? So funny that you just used the word coach, because that's what I was just thinking. I'm like, well, it's coaching, right? Like it's, that's where this, it's funny in mental health, that approach of you know, counseling versus coaching. Anyway, um, I think it depends where they're at. Right. Like, so this is the other thing I would say is, is I have done a lot of work in burnout and I, I see a lot of healthcare people. I see a lot of first responders. I also work at a private residential treatment facility for PTSD, um, which does some really innovative, um, a little off the wall, uh, approaches for treatment, which is really cool. Um, so one of the things that I've come to learn is severe burnout tracks more closely with PTSD 
than it does with anything else. Like this is not, this is, and I will even say my, my burnout. I mean, there are times where I'm hypervigilant and the best example, this is so interesting though, when, when the lens were being disbanded and when the government was doing that, there'd be like press conferences and we were just waiting for the ax to drop. Right. And so to control gossip and stuff, we would often watch those press conferences collectively. So we were all hearing the same message at the same time. And so we were all in our conference room watching this press conference and the minister of health said something like, and I don't want to vilify her language. I I don't know verbatim what she said. I know what I heard. What I heard and what I remember was those high paid duplicitous bureaucrats in the lens will find other work on the front line where they should be. And I had to excuse myself from the boardroom. So I had to escape. Like I, I was, I had a knot in my throat. I could feel myself welling up and tight chested. I was sweating. I was shaking. I excused myself and went and locked myself in a stall in the bathroom, let a couple tears out. And what I was thinking the whole time was, fuck no, she can't make me. She can't make me go back there. I'm not going back there. I can't do it. It was completely a trauma response that I had. And so when I heard a few different um, researchers talking about how burnout actually tracks more closely to PTSD, when that tracks with me. That just tracks with my experience in many, many ways. And, and so what would that mean in our system? Like, what would it mean if we started actually calling it something different? I mean, I'm not, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a researcher. I don't write the DSM. Like, I, I get it. Burnout's not a diagnosis, right? PTSD is. So if, we, if that's true, and if we started calling it that, what would that mean in our system? What kind of movement would we actually start getting in our profession around how we design things differently, move things differently? But then treatment, there's, a, there's some paradigm for how you treat PTSD. There, that's not new. And so instead of it becoming our own failures, that we're just not good enough, which then just perpetuates the perfectionism and the shit that got us into that mess in the first place, you can actually back up the train and go, well, hold up, what are you doing? So my approach is actually to own some of that, that this is what I think might be happening in my own humble GP focused practice opinion, right? Like, and if that tracks, then there are some things we can do to start to right size that, right? This isn't that you need, you know, a two week vacation. (laughs) This isn't, this is that we need to actually look and reprioritize. And also there is this whole concept of post-traumatic growth, right? Actually, I'm so curious to ask you this. You would know this. So there's this kind of metaphor that people use when they're talking about post-traumatic growth that you're stronger at the broken points. And they reference some physics and orthopod about when a bone breaks and reheals that it's actually stronger at that spot. And I can't place that in my own training to to validate whether that's true or whether that's some like pseudo bullshit we're feeding people to, you know, whatever, make them feel better about the fact that they feel a little bit broken there. Yeah. So physiologically, yeah, the bone is stronger there. It's the same with, I've heard that exact same thing, but with, oh, when you tear a muscle, what goes in its place is scar tissue and scar tissue strong. Yeah physiologically, that is correct. Like, but that's your bone and that is your muscle. I don't think that has any relation to what's going on up here. But sure, use that analogy. (laughs) Well, except, I mean, the analogy, so neuroplasticity and pathways and I don't know. I mean, whatever it helps. If it helps, it helps. If not, you know. But there is this idea that you can grow... And I do think that, you know, there's some other, it's funny, they're, they're leadership models for change, right, around growth and renewal and crisis and, you know, sometimes things have to actually hit a rock bottom before you can start to rebuild anew, mm-hmm. right? And, and so, you know, the other 
kind of idiom, you know, all these funny things that people say or come up with. But I read one that really resonated with me, which is when you're at rock bottom, awesome. You're still there. You're still standing. You just found out where your foundation is and what you're made of. And now you get to rebuild. Yeah. And I think that's interesting about, um, like a lot of people when they're trying to switch into the different career, they usually are starting from that kind of rock bottom place. And, you know, some of the people that I've chatted with have made that exact identification, right? They're like, well, I'm at my lowest point. Can't get any worse than this. So I guess I just keep going. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, absolutely. Like I'm laughing and crying yeah. in a gym <laughs> stall. Like, come on. Like you're off your rocker. Something's got to give here. This is not you. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And... And I think there's a part too, there's like some self-compassion in there where you have to give yourself permission to see things differently. I saw myself within a rigid, defined, this is the way we do medicine. This is how we do family medicine. This is, this is what we do. I had to let go of that and not see it. Find a way to not see it as a failure of myself and just to say that just doesn't work for me. For now, in this season, like, that's not me. And I think when I gave myself permission to do that, it was almost like a, a grace that, that made a difference. Actually, I had a friend and I was talking about this and I was so rigid, like, it just can't change. That's just the way he kept trying to, like people, it was a group that we were in and people kept trying to like, well, you could do this or you can do this. And I was like, nope, nope, nope. I can do none of those things. Right. And and uh, there was one friend in that group who <laughs> called my bluff. And I don't know. I, and I remember he's like, you're right. You're essentially fucked. You, you can't change any of those things. And it stopped. We allowed the conversation to pivot, which was great. I appreciated not having everybody telling me how to fix my life. But also, I remember being on the drive home. Going, Screw that. I can fix it if I want to fix it. Like there was a, it was almost like he tapped into that part of me that got me into the mess that was like, now this is a challenge. <laughs> challenge accepted. I can fix this. <laughs> so I wish I could tell you though, like in the, all the advice that I have for people, there's not a magic bullet. There's not a script. There's not a dose titration. There's not, it's not a simple fix. I wonder about... So this is a broad generalization, but I'm curious about your thoughts. A lot of people I've talked to, again, these second act actors, came from a first act very logical career, whether it was forced upon them by well-meaning parents or well-meaning society saying, the arts are not an option as a career. You must be doctor, lawyer, police officer, whatever. And But... They were, again, a very logical career, a very, you know, rigid, inside a box, non-malleable person. But then there was some type of ignition or pivot point or, you know, lowest of the low or something happened in their life that said, I am missing creativity from this logical science-based career and I, I, I'm realizing I'm missing that and I need that. And then there was a massive shift into a completely different, unstable, fully creative career path. Like mm -hmm. any thoughts about why that happens to what I'm noticing is a ton of people. I don't know. I guess I'd, I'd put it back to you in those people did they have that creative part in there and it was just hidden or suppressed? Cause I don't know. I, yeah. I don't know whether you know yeah. about parts theory and internal family structures and stuff, which is kind of a, a psychology and, and a counseling. Anyways, I won't bore you with theory. It's so cool though. and makes my brain tingle, but the, uh, um, so this, it's this idea that, that we have different parts and they serve us different ways. And I know for myself, I was a super creative kid. And I, I have sketchbooks of drawings and I love, I loved singing and I loved poetry and like, and I still do, 
But I watched that Becky dwindle as rigid, analytical, performing Becky grew through school, through high school exponentially. I got graduated with a 99 average and my well-intentioned dad, truly not an, an ogre. When I came home with a 99, where'd the other 1% go? Ha 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 ha. Well, shit, where did the other 1% go? And then it, it got worse. I got 103. Well, how the hell did you get 103? How many bonus marks were there? Oh, so you got 103, but you could have gotten 106. Yeah, yeah, I, I could have, right? Like he didn't mean, but again, in the place that I was, yep, I could have, I could have gotten that. Cause I could have probably, that's the thing. Like I, I was good at performing. I'm good at fitting in. I'm good at adapting. You tell me who you need me to be and I will figure out how to be that person, right? I just lost sight of who the hell I wanted to be. And, and so one of the things that I found in that moment, in that trigger moment for me was, and it was that Becky that had dwindled down to this, that creative Becky. I saw her on vacations. I'm like, oh, I miss her. <laughs> she was fun. My husband misses her. I know he does because he knows her. Is there room for her in medicine? And I could not, I couldn't in my practice the way it was. I, I needed things to kind of implode a bit in order to give myself permission to let her out. It sounds so dissociative. I'm sorry. It sounds ridiculous. But, but so now I think they kind of coexist a bit more, right? Like rather than being two distinct versions of me, I think they meld a little bit more. Um, certainly I feel more integrated than than that and I mean they both they're both kind of cool people they're just now they're cool people all in, in one. I don't know whether that tracks with other people you've talked to but I think it does and so yeah because most people I talk to start their story with I was always a really creative kid but mm. or I was always in the high school musicals then so like, do you think every person in this, maybe not everyone on the planet, I mean, everyone in a very privileged first world country that has the experience and the, of the ability to be creative, like, are we all like that? Like, are we all just missing a bit of creativity? Or are there people out there who are just so happy just to do their beautifully logical lives and logical jobs? Do you know, I don't know. So, so we have, I've alluded to my kids, we've got four boys. And when we were done, like actually done, <laughs> didn't want any more happy accidents, we, um, my family doc was like, oh, it's so bad that you're, it's too bad you're ending this experiment because they're all so different. So in my N of four at home, I have one who is happily very analytical. He has some creative outlet, but it is, it is minor. I would say I never saw it when he was younger. Um... I've got one who is so creative that, like, I just can't get him to conform to, like, perform to, like, <laughs> he doesn't, his handwriting is atrocious, and he, he alternates his capitals and his lowercase, and, like, and I've tried, I'm like, but you need to, I like how I write. So, well, honey, you know, you probably need to, why? Why do I need to do that for somebody else? I'm like, I don't know how to answer how do I tell them? Because you should, because there's norms, because I'm like, oh, how do I make this little creative soul still himself? And also, but I don't want to teach him to fit in, but I, maybe a little, <laughs> how do I do this? So I think it just, even within my own kids, I think people are, are just different. I think there are some happily analytical people out there. The caveat to that is my oldest is on the spectrum. And so maybe some of those happy analytical people are actually they're, they're neurodivergent, right? Like, and so on the spectrum of all of the ways that our, our psyches and our brains work, yeah, I think so. And I think that we all have, you know, I, it's all, whatever, it's a spectrum. The reason I was asking that question is like, are we all heading towards crisis point? You know, like, is it all inevitable that like everyone's going to have a first act career and then go, I hate this, and then have an existential crisis and then switch. <laughs> not that that's a bad thing. Sure, why not? 
Well, I was going to say, I mean, we talk about midlife crises all the time, right? And so, you know, is yeah. that what that was? Yeah. Yeah. You know, do we all have, maybe we all have four acts and this is just a natural arc, right? I don't know. It's Shakespearean. Um, or three acts. I don't know what that is. Do I, you know what, maybe. And that, this becomes maybe more of a social commentary than anything else. I actually think we live in a bit of a messed up culture and, and not... I mean, I wasn't raised to embrace the arts. Phrases like artsy fartsy, what are you going to do with an English degree? Like those were pretty common in my house, right? Like, so, and what I, I do worry a little bit because there's now this emphasis of, for girls of, of the STEM, I worry we devalue creativity and we devalue learning for learning's sake and, and, um, we devalue um, what creativity can bring. So, you know, I've tried not to do that with my own kids. But so in, in that society, are we all heading there? Yeah, maybe. Because how many of us actually were able to mm-hmm. consciously explore who we wanted to be? Like, if I'd gone backpacking in Europe, would I <laughs> If I hadn't been so beeline right like and if I hadn't been so young I wonder how much my youth actually contributed I didn't how how much did I know myself when I was making any of these decisions right like I don't know yeah I kind of wonder it's that it's that lovely Harry Potter quote that Dumbledore quote that I love about you know maybe we sort kids too soon into houses (laughs) you know (laughs) like why is it that at age 18, 19, it was like, yeah, better know what you want to do with your life. Oh, medicine, good on ya. <laughs> See you in 20 years. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm-hmm. It's so funny you bring up that analogy. We had this whole thing at, over Easter weekend. My kids wanted to know what house I would be in. What house would you be in? What house do you think I'd have been in? <laughs> we, were, we had like our own little sorting. <laughs> anyway. There is a quiz online. I'm sure. <laughs> what is it about the pandemic that you think, because the pandemic saw immense amounts of people wanting to change what they're doing with their lives. What is it about the pandemic that you think brought about that shift? I think it probably depends on what your role in the pandemic was how that happened. Interesting that a lot of people have come to the same thing, but, um, so let me wear my healthcare hat for a minute. I think for some of us in healthcare, it perpetuated that your needs come last. You're being called into duty and this is what we need you to do over and over and over and the chronicity of that. So I think people are exhausted and burnt out there. And there are some people who their burnout probably is on that more severe track where it tracks with trauma right and and they're trying to figure out what is their post post post-traumatic growth what is their next act right like that's the same language it's just one's medicalized um and then i think for other people they if you had people affected you were you there was we were as a culture faced with mortality in a way that most of us aren't acclimated to right we don't grow up in communities where part of me is wearing a farmer hat right like we're we're a bit sanitized from death in our lives and we don't have small town communities where everybody shows up for a funeral or like including the kids right like we don't we don't see all of that so this was maybe for some people they were forced with okay hang on a sec on that scale if if mortality of that scale I'm I'm mortal how do I want to live the rest of my days am I on the right track if this was me and I think that that put things into perspective for some people and then I think for some people it was a little bit of I am reliant upon things that are fallible I mean there's been a whole uptick in homesteading right like people just needing to feel a little more self-sufficient and and I mean, there's pros and cons of that too, but, um, so I think that's probably what's driving a lot of it. Can you tell me about your farm? It's so good. So we have chicks. We just hatched chicks and we just got more laying hens. 
I've got pigs, uh, which like every everything that we talk about pigs, like in common language, is absolutely valid. Like they are pigs. <laughs> they are <laughs> they're kind of amazing. <laughs> um, and we've got sheep. I always wanted sheep. My grandmother. My grandmother was an artist. Great grandmother. So this is cool. I don't, we don't have time. But she was in the 20s, like, trained with, this is family lore, trained with the group of seven, like, so I've got a series of paintings that she did that all involve sheep, that, like, as a little girl, there's one for each season, they're, and I inherited them through, you know, when, when my grandmother um, and her sister died, they bequested them to me, because they knew I loved them. So now I've got, like, we planted an orchard, and I've got sheep, so it's almost like recreating these pictures. Um, and then we got alpaca because they needed a home. Their family was moving and I, these alpaca needed a home. So we took them in, which fits in with like, that was little girl creative. Becky would like bring home everything with like broken wings. And so it feels good to be taking in tra traumatized alpaca and need it being rehomed. <laughs> um, and I started growing flowers which I knew how to grow. I've gardened and we grew all of our own food. We preserved all our own food. Like I grew up that way. But flowers have no purpose <laughs> except joy. And so as I shifted our massive, like when we first moved out here, we had a massive garden and we were growing what I knew to do. One of my brothers came to visit. He's like, so you turned into dad? I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> There's a quote from friends, like, I was so busy trying not to be my mom, I didn't see this coming. I turned into my dad. Um, anyway, so we've shifted away from that. We're growing flowers. And last year, we were still in a lockdown. The yoga studios couldn't open. My girlfriend does yoga. I was like, you want to come do yoga at the farm? Like, we'll just do it outside. And so we started doing Fridays at the farm. With yoga in with the sheep. And you pick flowers afterwards. And it was like... It was the highlight of my summer to see people so joyful in reconnecting to like silliness. Like it's hard to do lamb yoga and not giggle a little bit because, because hilarity ensues. Like there's animals and you can't control that and it's spontaneous. And, and I mean, and a good yoga instructor can make yoga lessons out of all of that, right? Um, and flowers and sunsets and like there's something just really grounding about being outside in nature and doing some of that anyway so like the purpose of the farm people say well what do you farm I'm like joy I don't know maybe I'm farming joy like it's just the stuff that brings us joy not all my kids all the time but and and I love the idea of having people come share in some of that that's so cool I think it's so yeah, it's so unique. And I, yeah, I, I, grounding is the, the exact word I was thinking of when, when I went to do the yoga and just, yeah, being out in nature is just something that is so underappreciated until you get out and do it and realize how important it is to be outside in nature when we, especially in this pandemic, have been like screened up. Totally. Yeah. Do you know, it's funny. So again, the part of my brain that still loves evidence and rigor, they've studied the benefits of nature and an evidence-based mental health strategy is getting into nature 20 minutes a day. There was actually a pilot project with a family medicine group south of us where they could prescribe it. They could prescribe park time and it like geo mapped from their demographics to where the closest park was and like, there's really good evidence that 20 minutes a day outside, in nature, unplugged, like no earphones, listening to birds, wind, like feeling, even in inclement weather, like feeling some of that stuff connects us back to we're not distinct from all of this. We are part of nature. This is, this is natural. Yeah. You know, the other thing last year, I would, I would rush home from clinic Friday afternoons and my husband would be out there with the leaf blower trying to like get rid of lamb droppings for people to come in and like I had gotten and then there were like mosquitoes and I was trying to 
control because that side of me comes out. I'm trying to like make sure that everybody's having a good experience. And by the end of the summer, I realized actually none of that matters. Like people don't care. They, there was so much grounding and so much joy that like lamb droppings, they, they, it didn't seem to bother people. Like anyway, yeah, it was really, really cool. So I am, I am looking forward to that. So I've expanded the flowers even more because I am still, still am a go big or go home kind of person. So I got more flowers. I hope there's lambs coming. So I'm hoping I have more sheep, more lambs. It's really hard to tell when a sheep's pregnant. <laughs> the amount I Google outside, like I'm in the middle of a field Googling things. <laughs> Do you have any final words of advice or wisdom for people who are kind of struggling or searching for kind of creative ways to make their tombstones better? <laughs> well, I mean, that's a decent exercise. Yeah is that it's okay to struggle, right? Just accepting that it's okay to struggle. I'm not supposed to have this stuff sorted out, right? Um, and that, like, that permission to figure it out, I think, is okay. There was a quote, and I'm not going to do it. I can't give it attribution, and I can't figure out where it came from, So, or get the words completely right. But it essentially said, if you can see your path laid out in front of you, it's not your path, because you haven't walked that, Right? So that part of our brain that wants to know, that's, it means it's not our path. So it's okay just to feel like I'm putting one foot in front of the other and I'm not sure where I'm heading just yet. That is like the antithesis of like the part of my brain that wants to do goal setting, like smart goals and like figure it all out and plan it. And I actually got rid of a planner that was doing that to me and it was perpetuating that side of my brain. I went, I can't know this stuff because I can't. This is actually my brain tricking me into thinking that I have control over stuff that I don't and I just need to let that go so that I can be happy. Um, and then just start to get creative, right? It's like that momentum piece. Creativity begets creativity. So just start doing something and it doesn't have to be good. You're not looking to monetize it, right? Necessarily. Um, and actually you probably get to be more creative when you're not actually monetizing it in any way, shape or form. It needs to be pointless a little bit and it can be silly and laugh about it. I think that's important. Especially, I think, in medicine. We do serious work. We need to not take ourselves so seriously. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And thank you, Dr. Becky, for being my guest this week. You are such an inspiration to me, not only as a doctor, but as a human and uh, I'm going to call myself recovering creative. I hope everyone also enjoyed her story. I hope you are inspired by what she has done and what she continues to do in her work, in her research, but also in her life. I hope you're inspired to try and find what farming joy means to you and get out into nature, even though it's frigid up here in Canada. This is a rough time in the industry up here north of the border. And I hope you found some inspiration. I hope you've you know, taken some time to figure out why you're still in this entertainment industry, because we need you. We need artists more than ever these days. Thank you again for listening to these two episodes in my what I'm calling Why Week. And I hope you'll tune in next week for another episode of Second Act Actors. Bye. Second Act Actors is produced and edited by me, Janet McMorty. Theme music by Guillaume. Additional sound editing by David Studio. Additional video editing by Jackie Wadewer. Show notes written by Sarah Hopkinson. I record using Riverside FM. If you're interested in developing an interview-based webcast like mine, I highly recommend this platform. Shoot me an email and I'll direct you to the wonderful folks there. If you or someone you know is interested in being a guest, email me at secondactactors at gmail.com. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share with your friends. My love language is words of affirmation, so compliments, constructive criticism, and feedback are always welcome and encouraged. Negative Nancys, Judgy McJudgersons, or Debbie Downers, unless you're Rachel Dratch, regarding me or my guests are not welcome. It takes serious courage to share your story with the world, so if you're tempted to negatively comment about someone else's story, please ask your therapist why you're such a garbage person. Save the drama for the stage. On that happy note, I hope you'll tune in next week for another episode of Second Act Actors. Bye! Bye!